so I'm calling the uh, Town Council Finance Committee of Tuesday, April 9, 2019 to order at five minutes after 2 p.m. And uh, thank everybody for their attendance. Uh, and I'm going to take this a little bit out of order for what we posted because um, I want to uh, allow our superintendent of public works to uh, be a to be able to get back to other things and appreciate uh, Mr. Mooring your being here. Um, so we were going to uh, think talk about enterprise funds first. Is that the what you were? So. Yes. Um, so the the purpose of this is that uh, we thought that it would be helpful for the finance committee to have a better understanding of how. Just take a minute. The enterprise system works. Actually, that's a good question. A minute taker. I did um, last time. Paul, who's taking? We're not having somebody cover minutes today, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll take. Or how often have you done? I did the last. I'll do it. Okay. So. Uh, You're going to give us a primer on enterprise funds. So, thank you. I didn't do the title. So, yeah. So, enterprise funds are a different way of keeping track of how we operate uh, a section of the town government. And the reason why I get to do this is three of the enterprise funds reside in the public works department, and the fourth one we have was shared with the public works, police, and the collector's office. So I deal with the two biggest ones on a daily basis, and so I got the great honor to do this one. So you know, an enterprise fund is basically an accounting methodology that gives us flexibility in how to manage an individual task or individual process we want to manage. Um, it establishes separate accounting and financials, and it keeps the revenues and expenses kind of segregated from the rest of the town government so you can really see. Um, the advantages, it identifies total cost, breaks it down much easier, provides useful management information as you're trying to make decisions, which we'll talk about a little later on, and it keeps the revenue you make and the revenue you collect in the same spot. It doesn't put it in with the general fund. Most of the time you'll talk about getting uh, some type of donation or some type of payment, and it goes to the general fund, and then it gets appropriated out of the general fund. And the enterprise system it stays in the enterprise system and gets appropriated out of the enterprise system. So, <clears throat> can I talk about some of this already? So you can list your revenue sources. Um, you can identify your spending types in, in the enterprise system and keep track of all this stuff. Um, as we look at the budget, in the future budget for the enterprise systems, you'll see that personal cost, whether it's regular time, overtime, whether it's longevity, whether it's uh, seasonal help, they're all kept in this one budget. They're not spread out throughout the whole budget. You'll also see that the retirement payments, the health care payments, they're kept in this, these same budgets as well. They're not shown up in another place in the somewhere else in the budget. And then, of course, maintenance and capital costs are kept in this budget as well. Um, <clears throat> it allows you to, by <clears throat> consolidating all these things, you get, they get to see a better picture of your management information. So everything is there, um, and it provides you really good decision-making tools when you want to uh, decide on rates or whether to increase something or decrease something or whether, even if you rather want, want to keep an enterprise system around. We've had discussions every once in a while about getting rid of one of our enterprise systems, and we use these tools and the fact that it's all together to study that and see whether we want to keep it or not. Um, and then it retains, like we said, it retains the investments inside the account. So all the earnings, everything that stays inside the enterprise system. So <clears throat> what can you have an enterprise system for? So the state law is very specific. You can have it for public utility, recreation, transportation. And again, in Amherst, we have it for four. We have it for a sewer fund, a water fund, solid waste fund, and a transportation fund. 
And again, the last note on there is just to remind you, you just can't set up an enterprise fund when you want to. It has to fall within the guidelines of the state and they control it. One of the interesting thing about enterprise systems is they're kind of universal across the country, across the United States. When I worked in other communities, we had enterprise systems as well, and we had to follow the same rules, and they were all kind of lumped the same. So revenue sources. So most of your revenue sources for an enterprise system is basically your user fees. Um, <clears throat> when we, people call up and complain that our taxes are so high, why is our water rate going up? Well, they're totally separate. Tax rate is based on the general fund needs. Water rates are set on the water fund needs. Um, you can also <clears throat> get revenue from other departments. Other departments, you charge them or they can charge you. That's actually an expense. But um, you can get revenue from other departments. As a um, water the system in Amherst, we actually sell water to Hadley in the situations where they have to have maintenance on their system or have to shut down part of their system and they need extra water, we can sell it to them. We also have people outside of Amherst who use the sewer system as well and the solid waste system. And again, your, your revenue also comes from your investment income. So whatever you have in your designated reserve account or your surplus account, it's invested in according to the guidelines and you make interest on it. You don't make great gobs of interest on it, but you do make some interest on it. The expenses, again, as we talked about, salaries, uh, just buying things, expenses, capital. Um, the other, is like we talked about before, is your health care, life insurance, OPEB, which is your other benefits post-employment, OPEB. You'll learn about that. Um, it's great. Yeah. Indirect cost. <laughs> Indirect cost are, are because uh, we're not a, our enterprise systems work with the rest of the town of Amherst, we don't duplicate services. So in our enterprise systems, we don't have an accounting department, we don't have an HR department, we don't have a town manager department. We use the existing town services and we pay a share of the, the town budget for those items that we use. Um, and those are the indirect costs that go to the town, those are the expenses that go from the enterprise fund to the town. Uh, other funny fact is, is one of our expenses is we pay property tax to the other towns we're in. The wastewater treatment plants in Hadley, we pay property tax to Hadley. The, most of the reservoir land around the watersheds is in Pelham, Leverett, some of it's in Shutesbury. We pay in Belchtown as well. We actually pay property tax to them. So those are expenses. Um, wow, I went really fast. <laughs> That's a basic outline of how it goes. Um, and if you don't have any questions about that, I have a little more to talk about. And I'll show you how we actually use these things when we kind of set our rates. Dorothy. What is, what is a bond anticipation note or a premium on a bond premium? Whatever, from my notes. What are they? They are just like in the general fund. If you want to do a capital project, build a school, for instance, you don't have enough money, you're going to take a bond out and use that bond to pay for the school. The enterprise systems has their own ability to bond of approved. So we replace, we're replacing all the meter, the water meters in town. It was a $2 million process. It was more than we wanted to take out of our reserve fund. We took a bond on it. We borrowed the money, bonded it. That's what that is. So. The enterprise systems do borrowing through the town, and they're kept separate as well from the rest of the town borrowing and bonding. Yeah, Lou. Does it count against our limit for bonding? Uh, that was a new one. I did. Now? That depends on whether it's voted um, as inside the debt limit or outside the debt limit. Some water and sewer projects are allowed to be outside the debt limit, and it wouldn't count. So it just would matter. Thank you. Most, I think, I believe most of the bigger projects we do, we're outside. The smaller ones are inside. Shelby? I, I had a question about the capital. 
expenses, and I don't know if you need to wait for that, but um, I noticed in the sewer, for example, the Amherst Woods was a new sewer system put in, and my question was again, you've heard me say, how do we make these decisions? Because I also heard from Hearst Road people why you know they've been wanting, I believe it's Hearst Road, they've been wanting a sewer system, so how are these decisions made where the sewer system goes and where it doesn't go? I can answer that question, and I will start by saying it has nothing to do with how we budget. Um, when we decide where we're going to expand our water or sewer services, uh, we have plans that we've drawn up of where we need where we need to go, and then we rate those. Um, there's a sewer master plan that talks about where to extend sewers, and as you look at that master plan, we have hit the top three areas on the master plan for sewering right now when we finish Amherst Woods. And if the town decides to sewer more of the town, we would go to the next one down on that list. So we have a master plan for how to expand the sewer, and that's how we decide which areas we go to next. Could you just share a little more? What, how do you decide that process? Like, what is the criteria used to decide those are the three main regions? That's a whole other presentation. <laughs> but it, what we did was we actually looked at such things as how easy it was to build a sewer system, um, how many people were in the area, how many septic failures they had, um, the cost, um, the cost benefit for that adding that sewer. Um, there's probably eight items we looked at, and those made up a aggregate score. And then they were rated one through 12, I believe. There was 12 areas that were left at the time. Um, I can get you that if you want, and you can see it. Kathy? Um, staying with the more general, but I have one related to sewer if we go to the specifics. Um, do all the surpluses always have to stay within a specific enterprise fund. So there are there any instances where the town can draw down on us? And is that, would we have to get to a closely related activity? Um, all the, if, if we have surplus funds at the end of the year from the water system, they'll go to the water surplus fund they're, and they're authorized in the water surplus fund. If there's sewer excess, it goes to the sewer. So that any surplus goes directly to that fund surplus. It has to stay in that surplus until it's appropriated out. So if you had a project and there's a sewer component to it, there's a water component to it, when the project is appropriated and authorized, you could appropriate funds from those to make the whole project cost. Um, I think that's what you're asking, yep. right? And it could, can the rest of the town ever borrow against, or are these really sequestered? They are really sequestered. Okay. And, and, and I guess in, in, along the same, so if we were, your fees in a sewer, your fees in a name another fund, um, would have to cover the indebtedness that the fund took on as well. There would yep. be no way that would spill over to the town that you can't meet the bond servicing costs or the debt servicing costs. That's two questions. Yeah, okay. yeah, so. Let me break it apart. Okay. It's supposed, the cost of the bonding is supposed to stay in the, in the fund. There is a chance that it could it could go into the general fund, and that's if the fund and the and the business you're operating actually fails. If we were actually to drive it into the ground and fail, and the sewer system had fifty million dollars of debt on it when we drove it into the ground, the general fund would have to take on that debt and have to resolve that issue. That's the only way that happens. Can I, I just stay with this. So if, suppose you thought you had enough fees coming in to cover your debt service and you misjudged, um, the, is the full faith and credit of the town at, at risk? So in other words, you know, we have to meet the debt obligation. Would be there temporary or would it be it triggers an increase in fees? What we would do is we had an issue where we need, had an unexpected increase and in, needed an unexpected increase in our fees. We would actually raise the fees. And if there was some type of issue where we had to we couldn't raise it all the way up. We'd have to figure out some type of financial methodology inside the fund to resolve the issue, and we would work within the fund. Yeah. Oh. Sonny? Just to add to that a little, this is why we have reserve funds and retained earnings in the enterprise funds. We try to, we're trying to build it up to 25%. Um, 
if for some reason you don't raise enough revenues in that budget year to cover all the costs, it falls to that surplus fund, so it nets it out of there. Once that surplus fund is gone, then we'd have to go towards the general fund for that. That makes sense, you're, protect, you're protecting the town, um, but also sudden jumps in fees. I mean, you're doing it both ways. Well, so one other thing is some towns, this town is very um, disciplined about saying sewer costs stay in the sewer fund, water costs stay in the water fund. Some communities will take bonding that's required for a water treatment plant or something and put it on the general tax rate. And the reason they do that is some people in the community feel like, oh, I can deduct my taxes from my federal income taxes, but I can't deduct this, the sewer rates. But um, that's not our advice, but it is an option if the town says we want to put this on the tax rate instead of on the sewer funds. But I'll add to that, if you make that switch, you have to be very thoughtful about the proposition two and a half consequences. If, if you want to see an example of that, you can look at our neighbor next door in Hadley. They actually will use sewer funds, or general funds and sewer funds for projects to upgrade their sewer system because um, it's sort of the reverse of what Dr. <coughs> Mr. Bachman said they use, they use general funds to help subs, substitute or support the sewer system because the sewer system is the biggest tax generator of the area. It, it sewers the all the, the um, retail areas, and that's a big tax bonus for them. So all the taxpayers get a lower tax rate, so they pay a little. So you can do it both ways. Um, but you really have to explain it when you do it. It's got to be explained why you're doing it and how you're doing it, because it has to stand the scrutiny of your auditors. And our auditors come every year, and they have to write a financial report back saying we're operating our system properly. Shall we? So um, I did have a question about the sewer fund, which I think Kathy just asked in general terms. but. What I was seeing was the increase in the operating revenue was 164,000, and then our debt service was 243,000. So I guess that's kind of what you were saying, where our revenues are less than, uh, at least over a certain period of time, I guess. Well, that's, so. you're, you're taking, let me, let me go to the next slides and I'll. I'll oh, yeah, you can answer it when you okay. think. And, and also, can you explain what capital program means? The capital program is, is our, <clears throat> it has multiple definitions. The state has one version of a definition for it. We have another one. Like our capital plan is what we plan to do in the next five years. So we look five years out and we say, these are the things we want to work on and these are the areas we want to work in. And that develops our capital plan. So it could be sewer extensions. The last big, the last big thing we were doing in the sewer is Amherst Woods, and we're still kind of working that out. But we've done little smaller projects of capital as well. And then um, our next big thing we're doing in the sewer system is going to be replace the gravity belt thickener. And then um, water, we have a capital plan. We have a plan where we're going there. So those are the capital plans. It's what we plan to spend our money on to improve the biggest pieces, the capital assets of the enterprise system. Yeah, the one thing I will add while we're talking about capital is that the another advantage the enterprise funds offer us is that we don't have to put that um, those expenses into the calculations that the Joint Capital Planning Committee makes because JCPC doesn't um, is um, looking at an amount that is based upon a percentage of the um, tax um, levy and uh, that's determined on an annual basis. And uh, that we, as we struggle to do many things with our capital, the uh, major expenses that go to the enterprise funds for water sewer systems that are not being paid out of taxes, then are not, um, they have, don't have to be considered as part of the JCPC process. Yes, Lynn. So if, we, but if we were going to put a capital expenditure value on 
these various enterprise funds per year, we could actually say that above the 9.5% or 9% or whatever percent we're going to spend as authorized through the council, this is spent for capital on top of that. It is. Okay. Thank you. So when we sit down and start talking about how to run our system, we <coughs> basically do the calculation. What are you going to bring in and what are you going to spend? Um, so this is a breakdown from FY 2019 of what the cost to set up this, the sewer uh, water fund and what our expenses were. Salary and wages, 1.1. Expenses, 2.1. Um, expenses gets broken down in many more things than expenses, but I couldn't, I, I could have been, I would have had to show you the whole budget to show you all the expenses. But like I said, it includes OPEB cost, it includes healthcare costs, retirement costs, Operating costs for electricity and power, uh, gas and diesel fuel. It includes payments in lieu of taxes to the town. It includes also uh, tax revenues. Um, and tax revenue, we have to pay to our tax liability we have in other communities. Capital, that's <clears throat> the capital we had for that year. We had $219,000 in capital planned for that year. General fund services, that is the cost where we talk about indirect cost to the, that's what the town services, the general fund provides to the enterprise system. The accounting department, the HR department, the um, conservation and inspections department, that's what we pay for those services from the town, our share. And then the debt, that number at the bottom, is what we're paying on debt service for the, all the bonds we have out in the water system. So then that's, that's what our expenses are. And then we look at what our revenue will be. Water rates. Is the maintenance included somewhere there? Like, I mean, I know the wells, because I, was, I am in South Amherst, and we recently had that well thing issue. So do we have maintenance? All, all the money for like uh, repairs to the wells, repairs to meters, that's in the expense line, too. There's probably close to 60, 70 lines in that. If you actually look at everything, we kind of break down in, in the expense side. And Guilford, when you get to the general fund services, is that just a ratio on overall revenue? You know, like your draw on the overhead is X percent for water and something else for sewer? Yes, it is, and no, it's not. Okay. It is a percent of the budget. But we actually, every few years, we go through all the services that we've been provided by the general fund side, and we actually look and balance to make sure that the percent we're taking from our budget to pay for the general services makes sense. We just can't make up a number, like if you're a million dollars short on the general side, need a million dollars, you just can't divide that between the, you have to have a rhyme or reason because the auditors will expect a rhyme or reason why you chose that number. My, my frame of reference, I'm just thinking, yeah, in, in large hospitals, so there used to be a debate on how much, of the emergen, how much the emergency room was really using the cafeteria, you know, in terms of it was being billed back, you know, it yep. was this, the same idea, a central operating entity was billing out to different departments. Here, you've got it sequestered, okay. Yeah, Two questions, picking up on Kathy's, but that general services fund, fund service is not a negotiated rate with an outside cognizant agency. It's done defensively so that our auditors accept it? It's done so that we pay for the services that our general fund provides to us and we have backup and accountability for why we're charging okay. that. But it's, it, it's set by us. It's, but well, we have to be able to show reasonable Re re reasonable process by which we set it. Correct. I mean, okay. if you actually break it down, break it down, the rates that we are charged are based on the contract rates for employees' times right. and those type of things. If we actually had, like, if we had an outside person providing this service to us, you would see that ex that number in the expense section. And my second question is about the debt line, and whether or not that debt line shows up in Sean Magano's work or it does it does not okay thank you and it i'm i brought the water fund from paul's budget document and if i go back to fy15 
the expenses ran higher than the revenues. What happens when that happens? I'll tell you in a second. Okay. Uh, okay. On the debt uh, side of for debt service, that to me that looks very big. Um, is this like good, or can is it going to get better, or should I not worry about it? Uh, no, that's it, debt service. Right? It's debt service. It is actually, and I'll show you where, how, where it comes from in a few minutes. Um, it is a good number. It's, we're not uh, we're not really deep in debt. I mean, we're actually altogether. This is a four million dollar budget, and out of that four million dollars, half a million is your debt service. To me, that's a lot of money. Uh, it's, it balances out well. It's our water. It's our water system with a lot of capital. Yeah, yeah the, the, I think that is a problem because you think about all of the pipes and uh, all of the. Um, plants that we have to run for the water. It's a very um, capital intensive operation. So then when we balance the budget, we're looking at these items basically. Water rates is our biggest source of revenue for the water side. How much water people use and what we charge for that. That's our biggest, uh, our biggest intake of funds and revenue. We have water liens. That's people who don't pay their bills. We lien them. We collect the water lien. That number is about what it's normally been. It's gone anywhere. One year it was 90,000. A few years back it was as low as 50,000. So we budgeted a number for that. Water connections fees, we always have new construction going on recently, so it's always a number you can kind of figure what's coming down the road. Um, so that's, that's the connection for one East Pleasant Street. That's the connection for one Kendrick Place. If you have an existing water line and you have to change it and you have to upgrade it, that goes into that fee as well, because there's a charge to renew your water system, to renew the connection. Um, other water revenue, it tends to be mostly things we sell out to surplus out. Um, if we have a piece of equipment that we, we trade in, that trade in value doesn't go to the general fund, that vehicle value goes into the other water revenue. If we collect a lot of water meters as we're changing them over, we strip them down, we have a scrap metal component, we have brass, and then we have general scrap metal. We send that to the scrap yard, that money comes back in, goes in other revenue. Um, if we do some special event and there's a charge for the special event, that goes in other water revenue. And then we have interest and late fees. Interest is not that great, it's like your savings account. Uh, late fees actually has been getting better, people have been paying more on time. So it's good. And then you see that line at zero for 2019. In 2019, we used no money from our surplus to balance the budget. So if we needed to balance the budget, we had more expenses than revenue coming in, we would then go to our surplus and we plug in a number for to balance the budget out. If you add this page up and this page up, they both equal each other, just like they should. But we don't do it in a simple method like this. Um, hold on. We do it. We have uh, a big sheet with multiple pages, and this is how we do it. This is actually the sewer fund. You can see at the top, you can see the different, oh, in this column here are the expenses and revenue sides. Um, down at the bottom here, we have um, where the cert oh, down 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 here is a certified free cash, which gets certified every year, and that, that's how much we can take. So we, this sheet has multiple pages, and I'll go through it really quickly. Um, our other operating expenses, our revenues, other operating revenues. These are the things that make it up. For the sewer side, we have entrance fees, septic tank disposals, liens, interest again, interest and fees again, miscellaneous, UMass sometimes makes a special, has to make a special payment for something they're doing to the system. Uh, we actually had a cell tower on one of our properties and the rent from the cell tower went to this. Uh, and then you have the rest of those things. We do get grants. If there's a grant, that would show up here as well. Um, so these are all the other operating sources. our expenditures, our debt. And then this debt page is really what you look at if you really want to see that number and where it is. 
So in the sewer system for 2019, we had $11,000 to pay for sewer, sewer extension number one, which is um, Mechanic and Chapel Street, I believe. And then they had a second, oh no, actually no, sorry. That's, uh, that's this is Amherst Woods. This is the Amherst Woods sewer, sewer numbers here. And then Pine Street, we put a sewer on Pine Street. So we're paying for the Amherst Woods sewer and we're paying for the Pine Street sewer in our debt right now. We've paid off other projects we've done. Um, we have the, when we do this and we start playing with the spreadsheet, we have this section called proposed debt and we can look at things we wanna think about doing and we can project out what, the, what we think the rates will be and what the debt will be over a 20 year period or a 10 year period and so we can do all our planning with this document to see where we are. Okay, when you're, when you're doing your playing with your document out several years, so you've plugged in 5%, um, does that cut across, so I'm thinking, Paul, across all documents that a best bet would be 5% for those years, or does each, each enterprise firm do its own crystal ball? That's, those aren't the rates right now, but just, you know, I ha I'm just getting a sense of, like, where does five come from versus two and a half? The interest rate comes from what we think will be charged at the time we go to go out to borrow. Sure. So it's, uh, that's a decision that's made usually by the finance director and in, in, in concurrence with the controller lately. They decide which one we're gonna go with. They talk to the, our bond council and they- So you basically would all have the some, same number, whatever it might be in terms of someone's reason, judgment? Yes, so I mean well, that would depend on whether we were permanently bonded and already had a fixed interest rate for some of these. And some are just um, bands that we haven't permanently bonded yet. So we get our best estimate from our financial advisor on that. This was the answer you gave me the other day. These bands are more, you know, you're not going to a really long term. You're doing a bridge. They're bond anticipation notes. So they're basically cash flow money while the project's being done. Usually when we're in the proposed section, it looks worse than the real life is because we're really conservative. We're just, even though this is Amherst, when we do this, we're very conservative about how we do it. Uh, and then this is our smaller capital. So these are the projects that we are gonna pay for out of our rates or out of surplus. We're not gonna bond for. So these are trucks, mowers, these are small sewer line replacements, collection system improvements. It could pay for a pump station upgrade, it could pay for a half mile of sewer line replacement, it could pay for other things. Uh, the vector, the sewer jet vector cleaner right down here at the bottom, that was a good one. That was a $385,000 piece of equipment. Um, and uh, it fit within our, it fit within our, what we had in surplus. In 2019, we, uh, we set aside a million dollars to pay for our new gravity belt thickener. Um, so sometimes we do have big, big ticket items in here, sometimes we don't. Yeah. Who makes the decisions about how you're going to spend your capital? So our capital decisions are made based on our capital plan. So that's where it comes from basically, and we move from there. Most of the capital plan is put together by the staff, our consultants, and then what we know with our permitting and what's coming down the road with DEP regulations. Though it does come back to now the council through the budget because the budget uh, that the town, meeting, town manager will propose will include a section of each of the enterprise funds that includes the capital. I guess, that, yeah, every, all this is just the planning process. It all has to be appropriated, and the appropriating body is actually who makes the final decisions, if you really want to say it, so. And just staying within that, um, the back and forth, so um, suppose the capital planning process for the large expenditures you've got would have, depending on how you do it, a differential rate on the water rates or on the sewer rates. Would that have to come back now to this, the town council to say yes? Yes. Okay. So, so, would... so let me, so we, that's the last page. So those are the pages that go back into the spreadsheet. 
That's the front page here. And then at, in this little section right in here, you can see the rates needed to cover our cost. So this is how we determine what we're going to recommend as a staff as the new water rate or sewer rate. And that's what we recommend, and then that has, does have to come through and be approved by the council or the water sewer commissioners. So yes, that's how that's done. So I guess I'm thinking, you know, there's one thing to look at the rates, and assuming you've done the math correctly, to say you need that rate to cover your costs, well, we're going to give you the rate, otherwise you can't cover your costs. And it would be another to say, do the costs have to be what the costs are? You know, which is what's driving the rates. And once you've decided to do the capital, it becomes the cost. But the year before, two years before, you can anticipate. So is, is there that, you know, if we do this now, the rates will be, we'll need to increase our rates next year or the year after? Yes, and we can do that in our document. As we actually look, there's different years here. So when we, if we have a capital question and we're trying to decide whether to do a capital project now or do it a year or two later to, to soften the impact on rates, we can go to the capital page, we can move it out a little bit, we can see where it fits in, and you can watch, it, you can watch the numbers change, you can see the rates change, you can see how much surplus you need to pay for your yearly rate, or you can see how your surplus is building or actually how your surplus is crashing. You can see all that as we go through. So we'll look at that as we go through the whole planning process. We'll move a project off a year or two years. We'll downsize a project to make it smaller so we can keep the rates within a reasonable, a reasonable area. And then we go back. When, once we've done that, we do do a couple more. OK. We, we, we do do a couple more. We do, we do, do a couple more checks. Um, even though the spreadsheet says this is the rate we need, and this year the rates need to be this, and that's going to be the recommendation to you, is that we increase our water and sewer rate by 10 cents. Um, then we'll go back and we check and see what everybody else is charging. So we don't just do it in a vacuum to see if we're in the right area, if, if everything is, we do make sure everything spits in. We don't just do it in a vacuum and say we have to make our world work. We have to, we make our world work in relation to all the other worlds. Um, the only issue is when we do this fact, this kind of balancing act, these are rates reported to tie-in bond, which is an engineering company in Westfield, and they put out a report every two years. So the last report was 1718. They haven't done one for 1920 yet. So those are the water rates, as you can see them marked. We're recommending going up to the rates that are there now in the yellow. Um, Northampton actually just released their water rates, and there's two Northampton lines here. This is their rate for 1718, and this is the rate they're proposing for 2020. Jesus. And we take it and we compare it. So th this chart here takes the rate and actually compares it to an average household. An average household uses about 120 units of water a year. So. We're charged the water rate, 120 units. You charge the sewer rate, 120 units. And that's how we come up with the overall number. So we're expecting if we increase the rates that the average household in Amherst, they'll pay just under $1,000 a year for their water and sewer. Where other communities, you can see, we're almost, we're almost at the bottom. Even though these are two-year-old rates. We're almost at the bottom of the, of the group we look at. So we check everything and we balance it out. We don't just think what we need. You've got two, Andy, two, Dorothy. And uh, yeah, Dorothy, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so uh, what do you attribute this wonderful news to? What wonderful news, that we have great rates? That we, yes, yes, that we are very competitive with having uh, lower rates for water and sewer. I mean, so my husband, I just hear, wow, the water rates are high. But now I can tell him, well, comparatively, they're not. But what are you doing differently from what other people are doing, or what's easier about Amherst than other places? Uh, we, also, we often get asked that question. Um, we have a really good staff. We have very good employees. If you walk at the, go tour the wastewater treatment plant, um, that plant was built and uh, put online in the 70s. Um, it's only had small little upgrades as we've gone along. We do have a major upgrade for the wastewater plant coming, and that's going to be a big number, and everybody's going to fall off their chair when they get that. Um, that's coming. Uh, 
when it comes is years away, hopefully. Um, but we have a great staff that maintains our equipment and they take great pride in the equipment and they keep it running properly. The water side does the same thing. We also have the ability to do things other departments don't do. We switch highway guys over to help with water repairs. We don't bring a contractor in to do that. Um, we bring contractors in for big things that take a lot of time. Um, small things that are quick and easy to do, we move people around and we take care of things. Um, we do have a complicated water system and that is a challenge and it's a benefit because we can switch water around easier than most communities. Most communities, Northampton has really only one source of water now. Everything goes through their main water treatment plant up at Mountain Reservoir, that's it. It all goes through that plant. So if something happens, it's just that plant. We have the Atkins plant, we have the Centennial plant, which is actually offline going through some upgrades, so hopefully soon the upgrading. We have baby carriage and we have five wells, four wells, sorry, baby carriage is a well, really. So we have the ability to be a little more flexible and be a little, a little more agile and responsive. Is Atkins the newest of the plants as far as the age of, since it was constructed? Was At Atkins and baby carriage are about the same age. Is there, yeah, go ahead. Can you do this same, some of us are an onsewer, so can you do this same kind of, or internally, I don't need to see it, but just water without sewer, uh, so, so you, you'd be able to do internally the same kind of look on pure water rates? Yes, I, actually you just look at the water, at the water column. If you just use the water column, that's what your, your, oh, uh, but I just didn't see that. Person. Yes, so the water column, you should, if you just have water, you'll get 468, and if you do water and sewer, you'll be the two together. Thanks, I just didn't see the, I, because. So our higher ed institutions, all three of them, are big customers. Are they paying the same rates as residents? Uh, yes. We used to have a stepped water rate. We used to have a rate that was three-tiered, the larger consumers paid a higher rate, which is, if you actually look at Northampton's water rates and the town of Hadley's water rates, they have a tiered system. Um, based on your usage, you pay more. Um, we don't have that anymore. That was changed back in 2006 or seven, seven or eight, I think. We just have one rate, everyone pays the same rate. Why? It was a decision made at the town manager's level to only charge one rate and do away with the stepped rates. We will probably be told we need to go back to a stepped rate system because it's uh, recommended by the Department of Environmental Protection that you use a stepped rate system, one, to encourage conservation, and two, to penalize those who are high user, users of water. Yes, Lynn. Is that a DEP requirement? I mean, how, what kind of leverage do they have over us to enforce that we do that? Um, in our next water permit, um, which we may see in my lifetime, uh, it will probably be a requirement that it's one of the conservation methods we can use and that we have to use. So there'll be a, a toolbox of cons conservation methods and the, that'll be one of the ones in there and I'll rate you on how well you do conservation by which method you use. And that's how we will probably be forced to go back to a tiered rating system. Okay. Gentlemen. You don't have to answer if it's not appropriate here, but I was wondering if he did want to go to the step rate, what would be the process? Like who initiates that? If we want to go to a step rate system, usually if the council wanted to do that, it would tell the town manager we want to investigate it, and we'd investigate it and come up with some uh, proposals for you and present it back to the town manager and it come back. Lynn. The reason it's a little bit different in this community is that we have our three major water users are our three, three higher institutions of higher education. So it impacts them dramatically. And I think uh, as a conservation measure, if you have a 
if you're a high water user as a residential customer, they want to encourage you to, to cut back. Um, and so I think that was part of the thinking at the time 12 years ago when they talked about this, and I think that was in conversation with the institutions of higher education as well, because it has a, the big impact is on those institutions. It is. If you really want to do a case study on the last community that just did step rates and the, the uh, feedback they got, uh, Northampton's the one to look for. They did a step, went back to a step rate system, and a lot of people um, raise concerns about it. And if you look at their step rate system, they have a residential step rate system, and then they have a commercial system. So they kind of came up with a happy medium that actually works. And so there's multiple ways of doing it. The way we used to do it is probably not the way we'd ever propose doing it again. Yeah, Lynn. So how do we, one of the issues with water in the, in ever, all the time, but increasingly is contaminants. Um, PFAS, I guess, is one of the big ones that's been talked about. How do we deal with that? Do we work with the state on that, et cetera? So we go through the same, we go through the same requirements of every water system for that, those issues. Uh, we have what our standard testing is, because there's actual requirements we have to test for and make sure they're not there, period. Or we have to make sure they're at a certain level, period. Um, and then we have a whole list of contaminants, which are called emerging, emerging contaminants. It's great. Um, yeah. And we test for those, <laughs> scary, too. I think is the word. <laughs> um, so uh, PFAS is in there. 1,4-dioxane um, uh, is in there as well. Um, there's a whole group of them that are in there. A lot of the stuff you see around farmland that is used in uh, pesticides are in those. Uh, we have not seen anything. Uh, every once in a while in our monitoring wells, we'll see a 1,4-dioxane hit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have not seen a PFOS hit, and we have stayed well below the interesting thresholds that have been set for the other un unregulated contaminants. And then what they do with those unregulated contaminants is every like 10 years, they take the ones that are important and they add it to the required testing and then it drops into the required testing pool. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, let's tell me. So going back to the step, for, for step rate thing for UMass, is that something we could use to get, uh, negotiate with UMass for, hey, we're not charging you a higher rate for water and stuff, can, can they compensate in other ways? Are we doing that already? So we can do that, and I, we, will be, we are having conversations with the university about a lot of different things. This is, we've just collected all of our interactions with the university, so that's one of the things. So I guess there's one thing that I just want, uh, want to clarify to the committee. Um, we are now the Water and Sewer Commissioners, um, which is um, an additional responsibility. It, the way that the former form of government was that we had a town meeting, which was legislative, and the select board um, was the administrative and the select board was the Water and Sewer Commissioners. Um, so when we received water and sewer recommendations at the select board, we had no committee to refer them to because we didn't operate with committees. Um, now the question is going to uh, probably come up as to uh, when the water and sewer rate process goes on, how it's going to work within the council, and I'm not sure that we've talked about that. Actually, we did talk about that uh, just last week. and. I can't remember which agenda it's going to be on, but as soon as we get them, it will automatically be referred to the Finance Committee. Yep. So it's and very we good made that it, we're learning about this today. And we also made it part of our charge. <laughs> we wrote a line in. Yeah. Yeah. Do, um, is there a requirement, and I can ask um, all three of our staff present, that we have, uh, that there be a hearing <laughs> process because we always, labeled something as a hearing process for rates uh, to allow public, invite public input. Is that a requirement and does the council have to make a decision as to whether 
the hearing be before the committee or the council as a whole? I don't think there's a requirement, but I think it's probably not a bad idea to have one. But typically the select board would, and no one ever showed up really. Right, but we did invite it. So that was, I mean, it just is another thing that we need to think about. I'm just trying to think about trying to create future processes, we, which we're doing as we go. Yeah. Uh, we could. So. We could include as part of our budget um, forum or hearing. If the timing is right. If the timing is right. That's the. Uh, so are there other things? I really appreciate the presentation and I'm glad that you ended with this chart because I've always uh, tried to lead with that when people uh, complain about property tax rates, say, hey, but you really do well on the water rates. <laughs> <laughs> I have some questions. Yes. Um, just from, from the, the totally uninvolved citizen point of view, um, we get these little robocalls now and then saying um, we have a slightly high level of something in our water today. Uh, don't drink it or boil it before you use it. And I've gotten a number of these, and I haven't known whether to be uh, worried about them. Or do we have them more often, less often? Um, just general comments on what this means and what we should think about it. We, will, we have not, we have never sent out a robocall saying we have a high level of something in our water in town. So it's not a town, unless someone is making. No. Then, then I must be saying it wrong because I've had it with the, the town manager named. I've received these calls. We had, we maybe they've low. said, they've said maybe watch out for your water. I have received these calls in Amherst. Yes, I have. We were receiving calls when the water level was low. The pressure was low. The pressure was low. Yes, we did send those calls out. And sometimes when the pressure is low, not only are you supposed to watch your use, but it can lead to maybe something? Um, I don't think so. It's pretty much watch your water use. In the, near, in the current future, I mean, we haven't sent out anything except for the low pressure calls that we had low pressure during the, one of the hockey games at UMass. Um, we, oh, it was the weekend of the, um, weekend of the Bar Blarney blowout. We, well, but he, about two years ago when we were going through the drought, we did get calls. Those are to conserve. We got calls to conserve. To conserve, right. We didn't call to warn people. I think the, maybe the last time we did something that said something about possible contaminants or that we were seeing out notices was quite a while ago. I don't... Oh, it, in the last eight years. I, I can go back and check. Uh, Under the previous town manager, I remember getting those calls. Previous town manager might have done that, yes, maybe. That was, we, we typically don't want to do that. We typically do not want to send out a robocall saying anything unless it's a dire emergency. And when you get one of those, those calls that say, this is a problem with the water, you shouldn't drink it or you need to boil, that's the, what we will say. And we will tell you specifically what to do and what we expect. We won't give out any ambiguity. We do not try like, to send out calls that give any ambiguous data or ambiguous information because that just causes more problems. Um, Anything else related to Mr. Mooring's presentation? Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This has been very informative and helpful. You're, you're welcome. Uh, we'll be back with the big story later. Yes. <laughs> so, then I'm going to go back up to um, the regional school um, issues. There are four things that we will be required to do on the regional school, um, and I just want to put them out, and um, I don't know, uh, Sonia will advise us in a minute as to whether we need to do all of them at the next meeting or um, only three of them, but the first one that uh, will happen is, is that there's a requirement that in the regional agreement for the um, schools that um, three out of four towns have to approve the overall regional school budget so that the budget has to be approved and uh, 
that's step one. Step two is the assessment method, which we've had a lot of discussion about. Um, because it is not the um, statutory method, but an alternative to the statutory method, it has to be approved by all four towns. So that's the second. Of course, then you take the assessment method and the result in the, um, of that versus in the amount that the budget that we would be considering and how much it is uh, proposing to be raised by assessments. And that gets to the amount that um, Amherst will be required to pay in the fiscal year. So there will be, have to be a vote to raise and appropriate the funds from the um, general fund budget to pay that particular assessment. Uh, so my question, I guess, was uh, on that one is whether that has to be at the same meeting um, or um, not. And then the fourth thing that we have is the capital budget request. And uh, I think we've previous, I've previously explained that, that there's a requirement that uh, if we are going to object to the capital assessment that they've proposed, that there was a 60-day window to do it from the time that we received notice. So that's the fourth thing that we need to consider. Uh, if we take no action, then um, that is the same. It, I mean, it says we agree to it, and that's it. Um, so I think that we have four things that are there. Um, and would you, Sonia, assume that we're going to take the vote to raise and appropriate the funds at the same meeting? Yes. So there will be four actions. And um, I, whether we do this um, at which meeting we do it, um, I think, yes, is a determination that the president will make. And, um, but those are the things that we need to have recommendations on. Andy, can I just, since the budget, since our share of the budget, but also the entire budget is dependent on the agreed on assessment method, how, how are they separable? Are you just saying we have to take a vote on each because we had to come up with an assessment method since it wasn't statutory. Once we get the assessment method, we've got the budget. You know, if we did it in a different assessment method, we'd have a different budget is what I'm... Now, if we had a different assessment method, you'd have a different way of dividing up the amount that needed, needs to be assessed for property taxes to the four towns. But... Uh, the it might not affect the, the total budget is what you're saying. It wouldn't affect the total budget, and there's a different vote requirement for the budget. I mean, that's okay. a statutory process that it has to be two separate votes. But um, if a budget passes and the assessment method doesn't pass, then the assessment method becomes the statutory method, and the statutory method gets applied against the amount in the budget that is to be assessed to towns. There are other revenues that um, are factored in when you look at the regional budget um, because it receives state money, it receives um, federal money through the state through IDEA, which is uh, for special education, it receives regional transportation money, um, and uh, could choose to use um, part of its excess and deficiency budget. Uh, and uh, other grants, so that oh, there are okay. other revenue sources. Okay, I understand. Um, so I think that uh, we've had several presentations um, now on the budget, and um, I didn't. Ass I assumed that we had uh, no need to delve further into questions because we had that opportunity at two separate meetings. One of the committee, and one that was of the committee as a hearing with the council present. Um, but we do need to, take, to make recommendations now to the council on the four matters that I indicated. Do we have these written up as the motions that they need to be? 
Um, the answer is no, but they will be, I think, is the, um, and I think that we know, uh, they're fairly straightforward. There's, um, the wording will need to be um, crafted before it gets to the council um, so that the, the actual wording of the motion is what we want it to be. So we can take a vote on these, but the actual motion that goes to the council can still be crafted after our vote. Correct. One is to, the first one will be, and I, and I think I'm gonna break them apart so that we can um, see if we have motions on each one of them within this committee and then can uh, decide um, when and how this is being reported. But the first one is whether to recommend approval of the proposed budget um, as presented by the superintendent to the committee and at the public hearing. Okay, so let me make sure I've got that motion. So it's to rec recommend to the town council approval of the regional school budget. Yes. Okay. So does somebody. And I guess I heard, I mean, Ann, you can wordsmith it later, but uh, the specific budget as proposed at the public meeting, I mean, we have an actual concrete proposal. In yes. Yeah. As proposed uh, by the regional school committee. Yeah, as proposed by the regional school committee, and or you could say as proposed and presented yeah. by the superintendent. Yes. I, I, I make, do you need us to make a motion and second it? Is that the, what we need to do I next? think so. Do you, Paul? You so I may have some sample su suggested language for you. Okay. Um, move that the town council, well, you would recommend that the town council approve the Amherst Pelham Regional School District operating and capital budget of $32,167,342 um, and that the town raise and appropriate $16,444,279 as its share of that budget. So does, and are does those two separate votes, Paul? You no, know, that could be one. one. It, it, but, at town meeting, that would have been one vote. But it combines your first and your sec third, third point. Yes. Okay. So you've got these motions, right? I, I have a sample motion, yes. Okay. So I'll get them from you for mm -hmm. the minutes. Um, so I, I put that motion on the table. Second from somebody? Kathy? Okay, so it's been made and seconded. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate. So it's five to zero. And is there an assessment method motion that you have to recommend or? Uh, Sonia went down to get that, so if you can. Okay. okay. Um, While we're talking about this, the, the real issue then is whether or not the rest of the finance committee, and that's the four of us minus Andy, feel comfortable enough with this to have it appear on the April 22nd agenda for the town council. And the reason I bring that up is because Andy will not be able to be there or will he be able to be there remotely. And so if there are any questions about the budget, about the assessment method, about the amount we have to pay for the assessment method or the capital, although I think we could wait on the capital, uh, the, re the question to the rest of us is do we feel comfortable enough obviously with Paul and Sonia's assistance to be able to answer any questions that might arise because that will determine whether this goes an agenda for the 22nd or whether we move it to an, a meeting presently scheduled for the 29th of June. So I, my, question, my question is if a member of the council or the public asked us a question at that meeting, 
and none of us felt confident to answer it. Would Paul answer it? Yes. Yes, yes Sonia and I would answer it, yes. Yeah, Paul or Sonia would answer right. it. And yeah. I mean, that, uh, the, yes, they would answer it. I then then I am comfortable in having the meeting at that time. To have it on the April 22nd agenda. And, and I am also, and we've been given background enough documents that I think actually help us even on things like the assessment method because we were shown the preferred method versus alternatives and it it quickly becomes clear this is, a, makes sense, why the four towns came up with it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, and the other point is you did have a public hearing on the regional school district budget and no one commented at that moment so there was an opportunity for the public to come in and raise questions. Right. It doesn't mean that, I mean, and the president could entertain questions or say, well, we've already had the public hearing on that, so they don't have to entertain if you chose not to. Correct. I, so. I did, on an issue of this, it, my feeling is that given the whole new cycle of budgeting and budget at, in relationship to the charter, this for some people in Amherst feels out of sync. So I just want to make sure that we feel comfortable and the public feels comfortable with our action. And uh, they only feel comfortable, I think, if we feel comfortable and we can convey that. That's all. Tell me. Maybe I need to go and read up about this, but is there a summary you can give of the assessment method, Andy Way? you felt this was good for our town. And, and if you think I should just go and read, because I honestly haven't read that document. So if you can point me to the document, I should read about that. I think, Andy, uh, just let me suggest that I think we could get a very good two or three sentence description from Sean Magano that would be fine and I would feel comfortable with that. Okay, take it off. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And I, it, and I think that what's important to recall and to report is, is that um, there was a process that involved all four towns and um, in the process, the representatives of the four towns looked at numerous methodologies and alternatives and uh, came to two, which was presented to the four town meetings with recommendations, three of the four members of that committee favored one, and one person withheld the vote. And uh, then at the four town meeting, we reached a unanimous agreement to the four towns. And I think that that's, so it's partly, I mean, to get, to get into the technicalities of all of the different methods that was considered, I think I'd have to call on Sean because I'm not sure that I could even pull that one off. I, I, we can ask Sean to give us and, that. And I, th I think if we had to add one more sentence, it would be that you've got a blend of the statutory method and our own method that we're gonna live with for X years. I mean, we've got something that we, you know, whatever that, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but it, it was a blend. And it was, a, and it was an agreement that we try it. Well, nobody's bound to it because we'll have to vote on it. Yeah. Each of the years, there was an agreement that it would be proposed for two successive years so that we would not do this process again. And, um, So, can I ask a question about the capital? Do we need to vote the capital? Um, I mean, maybe we're ready to, but it's not an expenditure until 2021. No, there's 60 days from the date that the school committee provided notice to the to the towns, uh, the member towns, and um, it, the action has to be taken within the 60-day window. We're well within that 60 We're well days. within the 60-day window, but it's not something you can leave forever. Um, you can leave it forever, but leaving it forever is agreeing to it. Um, I would suggest that uh, based upon 
fact that it was discussed at the Fort Town meeting and presented, and we all understand the middle school roof and the need to preserve and protect that building. And also, we in Amherst have the additional consideration that um, we might want to uh, have our sixth grade in a school, and we'd rather not move them from a school with a leaky roof to another <laughs> school with a leaky roof. <laughs> so uh, I would suggest that uh, the recommendation might be to take no action. Take no action or take action that strongly urges that they do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. In support of keeping our, our buildings in good shape. I have to go back and look at the regional agreement now to see. I think that it, it does set it up so that it's assumed to happen and only the only action is needed to, to stop it from happening. Okay. So given that and the fact that we'll be dealing with a lot of other budget votes in May, mm -hmm. it seems as if we can let that one, if we're going to make a statement at all about it, uh, wait, uh, and we can, by that point we can check with what it is the regional agreement. Yeah, I, I guess we have to just check to see when the 60 days is up, and I don't know if we, even, I'd have to look for that email to find. I, the, my recollection is the earliest it's up is mid-May. I think that's right, and of course the way they time that is, quite frankly, so that um, it goes through town meeting season in the other towns and uh, gives um, other towns the opportunity to um, act if they so wish. Um, under a town form of government, the select board would have to decide to put it on the town meeting warrant, so it would take an action of two bodies um, in those towns. Let me ask you this then. Um, how many towns have to agree to that capital expenditure? All four or just? I believe it's all four, if one objects. So my only reason for suggesting we actually proceed is to send a signal to the other towns that we plan to approve it. I actually don't, I'm not sure, Lynn, what you're asking, but I thought it made sense to go ahead and vote on it here. Um, I don't see any reason not to since we heard why and other things that it does for the potential of moving sixth grade in with some things with the roof design too. Yes. So do you have wording for the, uh, Is this both of them or just the first it's one? It's just the first one. The second one. Change to amendment to regional assessment? Yes. So All right. Yes. Yes. Um, the motion would be to recommend to the council. Yep. Yeah. All right. So the motion, um, I'm going to make the motion, if you don't. I don't. Yes. And that is to recommend to the town council that we vote to amend section six. No. Said. Is that is that correct? Am I doing the right one? Yep. Uh, of the Amherst Pelham School Regional School District Agreement by adding subsection J as follows for fiscal year 2020 only, comma the alternative operating budget assessment shall be calculated as 30 percent of a five-year average of minimum contributions with the remainder of the assessment allocations to the member towns in accordance with the per pupil method found in section 6E of the Amherst Pelham Regional School sure. District Agreement. The five-year average in, of minimum contribution will include the five most recent years or take any other action relative thereof, thereto. So motion's been made. 
Yeah, I, I second it. Yes. I, I just don't know. You may not need that or take any other action relative there too, but because that's more like town meeting language, but if it's there, it doesn't hurt it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I was reading the same thing. So the motions. Okay, so it's been motion made, seconded. Any discussion? All in favor indicate. So it's five to zero. So who made, did you second? Uh, yes, I did. And I, I, I think uh, the wording you just gave us is really helpful because that very first sentence as opposed to the italicized sentence is nice and clear. <laughs> you know, the rest, you have to know what Section six and various things are where the first is, you know, so the two together are very helpful. Yeah. When we give this to the council, we probably should have the regional agreement in the packet. Okay. Well, it's on SharePoint. The packet. I know that, but just yes. put it in the packet. In the, in the SharePoint. Okay. Um. So, do we want to do that? You know, I think that the uh, motion that we can make is that uh, we recommend uh, the uh, funding of the capital project for the middle school roof is proposed by the regional school committee and any appropriate action to assure the uh, Project. Um, I would so move. Okay, I'm going to have to get wording on that. Some, and uh, then it gives flexibility as to exactly the actions to be taken. I don't think that we have to specify which actions we're taking. Can you give me the motion again? We're recommending to the town, town council. To take. Uh, appropriate action in support of the recommendation of the regional school committee to assess capital funds for the repair of the middle school roof. Regional committee to assess funds, capital. For the repair of the regional middle school. Thank you. And uh, just uh, remind everyone that the way this will work is that uh, we will. Um, be assessed under a different assessment method than is used for the general budget. It is a method specified in the regional agreement for capital. And uh, yep. got it. Okay. Okay. Any? Is there a second? And, that motion? You we, made that motion? You made the motion and Dorothy seconded it. Okay. For the discussion, all in favor say aye or raise hands. So it's 5 0. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for getting the language, uh, Sonia. Did you, did, you need, did you need the fourth one? Because Sonia's actually given you one to raise an appropriate and transfer the available funds. Is that your fourth? That's actually the one we used for bullet number one and three. Right? Yes. Okay. Is, so, this, is this the motion, that Paul, that you read to us? It's No, it's different. So that one okay. we had to revise because it didn't have a funding source on okay. it. So you're, but you have the motion written Correct. down. Yeah. And it covered both, I'm sorry. You had both the motion the budget, written down. It, the budget and the raising the, the, raising and, the money and okay. appropriating the money. So, so we did the two together, right? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So we don't need four separate ones then? No. So is the, in the consensus is that uh, 
the committee will present it on the 20, proposes to present it on the 22nd. Um, do we want to, shall we just designate our vice chair to make that presentation on behalf of the committee? Is yes. the, the vice chair willing to do that? The vice chair is totally willing to, because I'm good. assuming by then I'll have a clearly worded <laughs> the motion, and I will be able to verbally explain why we reached that conclusion, yes. Mr. Yep. Mr. Chair, so, so we will do a, a, um, a memo that will include the draft motions. The draft motions will be on the motion sheet, so there will be three motions, and we'll do a memo that puts it in context that, you, that the council can refer to. I th I've noticed that the council reads its material, and then once they feel comfortable, they usually are pretty comfortable moving forward. And if we need to, I mean, we could do a half a page report that just says we're bringing this, and this is the reason why, you know, just as background to those. Yeah, and if you need to consult with me about it, try to do it before Thursday night. Friday morning I'll be I, thinking, Paul's reminding me I have to pack sometime. I, I will. <laughs> I think this is good because we have so much stuff coming down at us. It's good to tie this up so we can move yeah. forward. You notice yeah, that's I why so. I said about a half a page report, so yes, I can get that. <laughs> okay. so. Um, We put budget review on the agenda, uh, Paul. So at, after your last meeting, there were some members who had raised questions about where we are in the budget process. And Sonia has the most, re most recent um, overall budget review because, as you noted in my town manager report, I've been telling you there is still a gap that we're preparing to address. And that this shows where that gap is, and we can, Sonia will be able to talk about how we will get there to address it. So we will have a balanced budget come May 1st. You know, you know, one of the questions I had as you lead us through this is I saw the note in your manager's report. So I did, was not sure to what extent it was a combination of two things or mainly one source. So one would be our expected revenues locally were coming in at less than we expected and how much it was that the, the state funds were coming in at lower than what we'd originally, you know, so, so where the, or of course expenses could have been higher too, but we've been hearing expenses have been coming in about, right, so sort of the source of and I, I'll be able to cross compare these, but I figure you know that by heart. <laughs> I'm just getting to this one. So. You remember in Paul's report, he was talking about. Um, this Would you like me to run through this a little? Yes. From the beginning? Okay, we'll start on um, the revenue side. So we're showing our tax levy. It's the green highlight fiscal year 20, green highlight at the top that we're looking at. So our tax rate increased at 2.5%, and then we've, inc we've estimated our new growth to be 800,000. Um, that comes from our principal assessor, so it's a pretty good number. Then we have our local receipts. <laughs> and we, we base these figures on trend over the last three or four years just to see what their trend's going. Then we have state aid. The state aid numbers are the governor's numbers. We should be getting the House Ways and Means in next week sometime, and I will update with that. Our net increase in state aid from what our original projection was in October it was $18,000 more with the governor's number, so it wasn't a huge help to us. And then our the other financing sources, which is the ambulance fund funding, the um, CPA funding for debt service, and our enterprise fund reimbursements, what Guilford talked about earlier today in the enterprise funds is the indirect costs. This is where it comes into the general fund as a revenue source. And while we're still on that page, at the very bottom, you'll see under other financing sources, you'll see overlay surplus. And in FY19, you'll see we use 300,000 from overlay surplus. 
and we have zero in there at this point in time. So what you see is a, is a reduction of $300,000. So that's a zero at this point in time. But last year we used 300,000 of, of overlay surplus. So is that basically how you help balance it? Yeah, you pull down on that, yeah. And just for the record, this is not a recurring revenue source. We've just had a couple of really good years with our abatements and exemptions that we've had to pay out. Then on the other side is our expenditures. We have the um, town operating budget increase of 2.8%, and the reason it's 2.8% is um, the added expenses for um, for the council costs. Yeah, that's a 0.3% increase overall, just so you know. And then our elementary schools at 2.6. We net out the choice and charter this year. The assessment came in lower, so it, it was in favor of the schools for a little bit. Most of the time, it nets out to about 2% for the schools. The regional assessment, which is the number you just um, voted to recommend to the council. And then the Jones Library tax support. And the next section is our capital budget, and this includes our debt service. And if you look on the revenue side, you'll see the corresponding 421, 465 for CPA as a source to pay for that debt expense. So there's our ongoing debt, our current debt, and our projected debt, and then our cash capital that we're paid for. So our 9.5% of the tax levy was 5014825 and that's what our capital plan will work out to be as well. Then we have miscellaneous expenses, which is our retirement assessment, our regional lockup assessment, um, our OPEB, and we no longer need reserve fund with this form of government, so that's been eliminated, the 100,000. And then the unappropriated uses are the reserve for abatements and exemptions. Another word is overlay. That's where we get our overlay surplus. It's recommended by the um, DOR to appropriate 3% of the tax levy to cover any abatements and exemptions. We've always only appropriated 1% of the tax levy, and that's usually been plenty. We have a really great assessor, and he does a really good job at setting our tax rate. Then there's the cherry sheet offset, the assessments and the offsets. And we have our tax title. We raise 10000 a year for tax title accounts. And then the 6104 is for our Pioneer Valley PV, PC, Planning Commission, thank you. And we short revenue 385,848, so that's our deficit at this moment. Now, we'll, this will change once the House Ways and Means budget comes in. We'll see if we, have, we work out better. We have a plan to use overlay surplus again this year if we need to, to help supplement the capital so we can keep it at the 9.5%. Does any so are the I pulled out the um, sheet that you had as of October 18 mm -hmm. this so um, on the revenue side we're a little bit higher than where you've been I mean not much um, but you've pulled the deficit down by some of the other things right but so my I, two questions are on the town sources our own tax these are increasingly solid numbers right? So yes. The, uh, the, let, the ones that are still uncertain are exactly what we're going to get on state funds. Would that is that an accurate statement? Yes, that and new growth. It could be a little more new growth. It could be a little less. That gets certified by the state as we're setting the tax rate. Right. The revenues right. never get settled until the tax rate is is set. There's always some adjustment to local receipts. We have to. It's a huge calculation, and there's rounding, so some numbers change but very insignificantly. 
Yeah, we usually set the tax rate in, last year it was October, so we're hoping October again this year. So you had one line in the old sheet called PEG, P-E-G, that has disappeared now. Did that fold into something? Yes, that was um, for the Amherst Media Audio Visual. We authorized borrowing of 410000 after discussions with um, Jim Lisko from Amherst Media. They're not going to borrow the money in this, they're not going to be spending any of their money in this fiscal year, the remainder of this fiscal year, so there won't be any debt service in 20. It got pushed out for one more year. And I just did that this morning, good eye. No, that's a $100,000 gift, that's, that's helpful. I'm giving it a pause to see if there are other questions. What we're going through is really not different from any other year, that because we receive so much revenue that comes from the um, state that shows up under the state aid categories and the uh, Governor's budget is not the budget. That's the only number we have to operate on right now until the legislative process starts. Um, we don't really know, and it doesn't start until, uh, actually we should receive the Ways and Means Committee budget House. tomorrow. Yeah, That's, um, that is the projection, is tomorrow. And uh, because it's always Wednesday before Patriot's Day week. And then right. they take it up the week after Patriots exactly. Day week on the House floor after receiving all of the amendments. Um, do, do we usually do better in the, in the House and the Senate? Yes. Thank you. Usually the governor's budgets are low watermark. Yeah, that's my experience with other parts of the budget. In, in, in the... Um, the Senate, I don't think I ever recall them coming in with a number lower than the House number. And, uh, and recently the state did, they were projecting a deficit and not a deficit, but not get bringing in enough revenues, but they've corrected and said that they're now on target. So I don't see a problem at all. So we will, uh, but At this point, um, the question really is whether we uh, project that we have enough flexibility with other revenue that we think we can cover the expense side of the budget with revenue that we reasonably project to have. And I think given the fact that there's the overlay surplus possibility that the answer is yes. And does, does everybody know what the overlay surplus is? The overlay surplus. Why don't you go ahead with that, Andy? Yeah, uh, I can do this. Any of uh, three of us can do this. Uh, there was a mention um, on the um, budget that. Um, an amount of 1% has to be set, at a minimum of 1% has to be set aside in each community that shows up as unappropriated uses reserved for abatements and exemptions. And um, that's um, referred to as the overlay account. And if people, taxpayers contest their um, assessment um, and there's a, uh, decision um, in favor of the taxpayer, that's where uh, the flexibility is to repay that. Um, the, um, after a certain number of years, if the um, fund for that particular, for any particular year is not used, um, it can be declared as surplus by the Board of Assessors and then can be reallocated for other purposes. That's what the overlay surplus account is, and there is there is some flexibility that comes from that. 
Do we let it accumulate until we need it in reserves like this, which is not, you know, it's kind of a nice cushion that you've, you've got. You know, so does it, can it just build up, or do you know that we're never really drawing down on it, so do you end up spending part of it every year? Um, we can let it build up. We're usually a couple of years in arrears for, for drawing on it. Once we declare it surplus, we can spend it for any lawful purpose. However, if you don't spend it by the end of the fiscal year, it closes out to free cash. So it doesn't just stay there, and the surplus doesn't stay there accumulated. And what does free cash mean? <laughs> it's, it's what the, um, what the uh, state certifies every year, year end, our, our um, undesignated fund balance that's not obligated for anything. They, they certify that as free cash. So it's part of our reserves. So basically it stays in reserves. Right. So it, it's, it's, e it's even more flexible than surplus, because surplus has to be spent in a year, so. Right. Yeah. So no, the overlay surplus has to, well, you specifically vote it. Uh, Once it's released from, by the Board of Assessors. Once it's released from the overlay account and declared surplus, it becomes available for expenditure until the end of the fiscal year. Is, is this what we would refer to as our rainy day fund? Not really. You can't really count on it. Our rainy day fund is mostly our reserves. Stabilization. Right, stabilization. Our general stable, okay. Yeah. The reserves are composed of what is referred to as free cash and then what is put in, what we deliberately put into what's called the stabilization fund. And stabilization fund gets voted in, I think still by a majority now, and but it takes two thirds uh, vote of the council to take money from stabilization. There was, um, an effort to try and um, increase stabilization over the past few years, yeah. in part um, because it's a part of the flexibility that we're working on with the capital projects. And the other thing that I just wanted to point out on the expenditure page under miscellaneous, the last item, when there was a reference made by Sonia to the reserve fund, that's not the reserves. That was an entirely different thing. Yeah. And that had to do with the fact that town meeting would pass budgets, but town meeting only met twice a year. And if there was um, any kind of expenses that needed to be allocated between times, the finance committee could vote to make um, expenditures from the reserve fund. So money was appropriated to the reserve fund for that purpose to provide so that there would be a body, the old finance committee, to make that recommendation. Because we are now a council that is meeting uh, at a minimum of twice a month, uh, we don't need to have that reserve fund type of um, action for flexibility because if there's an emergency expense, the council can always take a, a vote at any time. Um, and. Uh, that uh, sort of obviates the need for that. It's, it's really a mechanism that belongs to towns, not to cities. Andy? Yes. Um, I have a comment about the um, abatement fund. And that is that it is good that you haven't had to spend too much money on it recently to allow the fund to be good. But um, there's maybe some challenges to um, um, Oh, I forgot the word for when you evaluate a house. Um, based on, on some of the difficulties with um, houses nearby with, with a lot of students in it that are impacting some property values right now um, in some of the areas near the Carleton University. So I just want to say that I think it's good not to waste money on that and to point out that that's a serious thing that we have to look at. I'm not sure whether it gets looked at in the new CRC committee or whether in the finance committee or where it gets looked at. But. So, so the, the assessors would look at that. They determine the property value based on sales, actual sales, and people will come in and say they may make an argument, my house isn't as valuable as it 
should be otherwise, but they will take that into consideration. But really, it's based on actual sales on the ground, and that's how they have to base it. And the arguments made to the assessors have to be based on sales data as way as well. As well. well, there's some houses that can't sell because of being too near party houses. So uh, I guess the answer is it, they could sell and it, maybe the, the, okay. if, they, if the price were right. right? They, they could sell to somebody who's going to rent it out to a lot of individual students. And, but and that's kind of a, against some of the... I'm just mentioning that this is... That the, the idea is to keep good, good assessments on the houses, to keep the houses valuable. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Without going into delving into a topic that's not really our topic, uh, the sad thing is is that the conversion of houses to student rentals has actually increased property values, and not decreased property values. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So that your your house, even though you don't want to sell it that way, goes up in value, and it's what you feel about your neighborhood didn't, <laughs> but it it's a market rate, not a <laughs> personal. Yeah. Yeah. So there, yes, uh, Lynn. Um, I would like to go back to item five and make one request of this committee with regard to the um, issues around the finance committee charge. Okay, we got there, but I think we can go there now. I'm, I'm sorry? We hadn't started the discussion of the charge, but let's, let's Go ahead. Oh, I don't. I didn't know since the charge was accepted by the town council. Um, why don't you start the discussion and then I'll add my. Thing. No, I just didn't know if there was any other comments that um, would come from the committee, which is what you're about to do. So I didn't have a specific reason of my own to put it on the agenda, but I wanted to allow it to come before the committee if somebody had something to raise, so that was why it's there. Okay. So you had something that you wanted to add? Yes. Um, I would like the Finance Committee to develop a set of questions for uh, consideration by OCA as they proceed to interview. Uh, they're doing this for other committees and I believe that it's appropriate for the Finance Committee to at least provide input to those questions. This is, this is for the residents who will be um, recommended to the Town Council by OCA for membership on the Finance Committee. So, How do we? Do you know when those interviews would start, Lynn? Because I could, um, we're not meeting next week, but I could draft some questions and share them with everyone by email. And then the question is, you know, since we can't each talk with each other, and it'll be two weeks from now, so I just don't know what the timing is on getting I, them a set of questions. I think that will be definitely be soon enough. Soon enough, two weeks from now? Mm -hmm. They have not set up any interviews. So, not that I'm aware of. So if I draft a set of questions, mm -hmm. get them out to everybody, so we make it the first item on when we come back together again, that we look at that? We do have to, I believe, isn't, isn't that the meeting also, Sonia, where you've arranged for the actuary and the um, somebody else to be, oh, the bond person? Right. So, yes, that would be, I think, the right time. Okay, I'm willing to volunteer for that, and as I said, I'd, I'd get them out as quickly as possible so people could do their own edits, changes on it, so we'd come together with a group think, starting with a piece. We had a little bit of a discussion of skills, range of experience, knowledge, but trying to tease that out with specific questions that would go beyond what we might see on a resume or a CV or 
whatever else they brought as a document would be great. So you would uh, share it back with your, your draft back with the committee, but it would not be for this. I'm thinking of open meeting law and what we know from Attorney Goldberg. Uh, I'd ask, not ask for any comments on it other than everyone would have an initial draft. So they, and I'd give it to them in a Word document so they could say, I don't, I've thought of two more things or I think this but, isn't. But the request is to. Bring those comments to the meet to, to the, an open to meeting, not to exactly. not to send them back to Kathy. Exactly, just come to the meeting with your printout on your machine, whatever way is easy, <laughs> so we so, could have a focused discussion. So we would have. So uh, let me amend this by saying, I think it's not just questions, but it's also qualifications. Yeah, I was going to pray you. That we're looking for the following range, and it would be great if they didn't all duplicate. You know, I thought I'd said some prelude like that, and then here are questions. Yeah. So, the here. Yes. Um, so you'd circulate the questions, and if we had other things we wanted to add, we would add that to it. And my suggestion would be that we just, you know, write on the sheet, um, check any, the ones any, you like, what, and add comments, and then become ready to discuss them. Exactly. Any way you want, just don't send them back to me, and don't send them to anybody else. I'm always a typist, so, but any way you want to write. Well, if, if we get your questions and we wanted to add something, how would we do that? At the meeting. Just and, at the meeting. Yep. Okay. But come to the meeting with, as you just said, Dorothy, if it's easy to just write on what I send, have them written out so we can be efficient. Yeah. So, I guess the only thing that I would say, um, since we're in public meeting and I can say it here, uh, I would certainly would like to make sure that anybody who's considering the committee has a personal commitment to attend all meetings. Um, that if there are barriers to their being able to make that commitment, I think it's something that should be known. We might want to have a description then of what our meeting schedule looks like, particularly the heaviness of it as we get into the spring. Yeah, I think, you know, I have you all just sent us the electronic copy of our current meeting schedule, so I can, we can make that plus whatever we come up with plus what we think. July or September, you know, the months where we didn't exist, what we think those months are going to look like looking forward. Yeah. So it's really a question, questions, qualifications, and example schedule. Okay, anything else on that subject? Uh, then I want to, uh, let's do, before going to our own housekeeping things, uh, see if there's any further discussion or questions about the schedule. And I know that there is one regarding possible June meetings, which are the if needed meetings. Um, but uh, the schedule that's proposed for May um, are there any questions um, about May before we jump into the June question? Uh, then uh, I think we have agreement. Thank you to Paul and Sonia for having made the arrangements for May. Um, June, we don't know what we will need at this point. Um, during that, we, we will have a requirement to complete our work by the end of May and to report back to the council. The council really has the month of June 
to work on the budget could be referring things back to the committee for additional investigation as questions come up. Uh, so I think for that reason and for other reasons, uh, we did reserve dates on an if needed basis, but there's been a question that's been raised about um, scheduling problems for one and of our members. Just one other thing, Andy, last time we discussed that that first June date, you know, I'm, and I'm fine with not meeting in the afternoon, the first June date might focus on capital because we're about to have a capital forum. Um, and so rather than it be FY19 budget adjustments, it might also be, you know, the prelude to Paul, Lynn, however we're thinking of doing that capital. What does that look like? Because it's supposed to be this year's capital, but also inventory. It, we have that requirement by, it's already set in the, right. Lynn, you've already set a date for it, right? We have set the date of June 10th at 6.30 for that forum. It will be in this room. Uh, uh, the town manager and I have had an initial discussion, but I really feel that the last time when we discussed the forum presentation, it benefited from this committee uh, giving input, and so I definitely would like to see us have that opportunity at the beginning of June. Let me also add, I have no problem with changing the time when we meet. Yeah, I'm fine too. I'm totally flexible to shift it to mornings and to other days, but Tuesday mornings are fine. Thank you, because I, I will, I'm pretty sure, be teaching that course just in the month of June <clears throat> in the afternoons, uh, including Tuesdays and Thursdays. But um, 9 o'clock uh, or 9.30, I don't know, whichever is better. What do you think? Preference. I'm fine right. with either. Yeah, I'm fine with either. Um, I'm an early riser, so but any anything that's easier, Dorothy, if it's easier well, for you to do uh, nine, nine. Nine would be better, so I don't have to worry so much. Okay. 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 So we will agree that any meetings during the month of June will be scheduled for 9 a.m. as opposed to the afternoon. And thank you. And the only thing, uh, Kathy, perhaps because of mm. Andy getting ready to leave town, um, could you make sure that um, the town, that Angela knows of these changes because of scheduling rooms? Yes. Thank you. So I just guess to Jennifer's make sure, one. Can, Kathy, we don't have any June 4th. I have rules meeting. Say, say what again? The June 4th, we have a rules meeting in the rules. morning. Uh, Only on no, June 4th. No, no we the can't. council votes on June 3rd. We, we, okay. in theory, yeah, have yeah. finished our job. Okay. It's not in theory. <laughs> <laughs> the charter says Whenever we're done. Whenever you don't finish at that point gets we're, referred we're, to another committee. We're done, Shalini. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to the top of the agenda. Um, in, yes, you had something else on this? Okay, um, so we've we've taken care of one, two, and three, of course. Um, so I wanted to get back with four. Um, I don't. Ha I was reviewing um, one set of minutes, um, and Mabel Stunden will send those to you. I was uh, started working on that. I think it was. You know, I I didn't have in my notes. Lynn, did you do one other set of minutes that we didn't get back? I did, but you two all have to, you, somebody has to tell me what date those were. So okay, I, I believe it was March, I went through all my minutes, and I think it was either March 11th or 12th. I'll send you the note for it. I, you know, I went, I went through the meetings that we had a draft of, and there was one I found that we didn't, and I thought it was you, but I'll, I'll I'm I'll, sure that's it if you'll just send me an email and tell me which one. Okay, thank you. And Shalini and I are gonna do a joint set from last week we just don't have them ready yet. And uh, I'll have it sent to you the February 26th um, before I leave. Yeah, it, I actually think it was March 19th, but uh, it, it March looked, 19th. it's March 19th. This is the Dorothy first draft. Okay. What's going on with our 
Sorry, I don't know why when I touch mine, I'm trying. Yeah. Is it better if I put it there? Yes. Except if I don't, I can't. Get it. Um, here. So, How's this? Ah, talk to the left, not to the right. Did we decide on the method where one person just is assigned to approve minutes? Yes, we did. I remember that. And who? And it, is that person the chair? Yes, it is. I remember that. It's, I've got it in my notes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so obviously this is not going to happen before you leave, Andy, but um, unless, you wanna, unless you would prefer that we reassign that. Um, you know, we had a quick discussion, and I just thought, you know, several times Andy made track changes, corrected a couple of things, and we were quickly to yes. But if anyone wants to redelegate it to me, I'd be happy to, and I'd always want to check with Andy to make sure we didn't miss something, but you at least have two sets of eyes looking at it. You know, if we want to delegate it that way. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. More importantly, I just feel we need to get some minutes posted. And if we can do that in the next week or two, that would be good. Yeah, because what, what I ha have done when uncertain, it's what Shelanie's doing with this, could, is go back and watch the film if I have to, to just make sure, if there were, and sometimes it's just been straightforward what we did, but sometimes it was a conversation. So I okay. think we could get caught up by next time we meet. Could, could I ask, I, I turned in those, the uh, draft of the minutes for March 19th quickly. Um, was it, yeah. what's the delay, or is it, I mean, I, um, I did ask some questions in it, but did it just get, did it get lost think, between I the think, people? I think it just, uh, I, I take responsibility for it, and it's just the amount of things between JCPC and the Finance yeah. Committee yeah. going on at this time. Uh, it's just been a very hectic period. And I, I know we it, so. minutes minutes are burdensome. Um, I'm willing to do more than my fair share um, as long as people are willing to take what we call summaries of the discussion because um, I, I can type and listen and talk at the same time. So, I type badly, but I go back and fix all the typos. So are we agreeing that Kathy is going to take over cleaning up and consulting with us if she needs to individually and approving minutes and getting them filed, getting them posted. Yes. Uh, I, thank you. That sounds so good. If, if, if Andy likes it, that's great with me. I think that's fine. I appreciate it, Kathy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so anything else on minutes that we need to talk about right now? Uh, we finish. I think that then uh, there's no public to comment to, to task if there's public comment. Um, is there anything else on the listed agenda item or other business that was not anticipated yeah. to raise? I have a question. Uh, Lynn mentioned that meeting on the June 10th so quickly. I don't know what it is. I haven't sent out an email. <laughs> Um, we have tentatively identified June 10th as the required public forum for the Capitol. Um, it, it's, I'm, I'm not going to come up with, up with the right wording, but it, it's all about capital. Right, right. Capital expenditures, uh, present capital looking out over five years, and some mention of the large capital projects and maybe even some more use of the model. And just because forum and hearing, one of them has the weird requirement is, which one is it? It's a forum. It's a forum, which means right. if, if we talk for half an hour, we have to wait for them for half an hour. We so actually are, are um, we may have a question into town, the town attorney on that. Uh, we have also consulted with um, the charter, members of the former charter commission and who all seem to feel that dialogue that might take place after presentation would be considered part of public comment. So that mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is come up with a way in which there's more of an exchange mm -hmm. during public comment than a stifling of everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Good. Yeah. 
And, and one of the things I thought we would do in District 1, just to give, we have, oops, go to the left. <laughs> My, this, this one is a friendly mic. Um, in District 1, we have a meeting schedule, a district meeting schedule on May 12th. And I would try to do a preview to ask people to come, you know, to try to rally the team to come to the June meeting, to be able to ask longer term as well as short term questions to realize we really wanted to get input. So there might be a way of doing a better job of encouraging people to come um, if we knew we were doing it. This is because you're also, the thing says we're supposed to do current longer term, but also talk about an inventory of the town. It's kind of a, like where we are. So it'll be the first time I think we've ever done this in Amherst, right? Focus separately on the word capital. Paul? Well, yes, so what you will be seeing is um, what we can put together in time for this forum. So it's not gonna be an ideal, and as you noted and you said that you're on, on the JCPC, we have money set aside to do a really thorough inventory of all the assets of the town, and that's, that was sort of the goal of that, those funds being set aside. Well, uh, Paul, uh, what Kathy is saying is great. Linking um, the district meeting with getting them involved and in coming to this uh, forum, and uh, we have, District 3 has a district meeting scheduled for Thursday night, June 6th. We had to change it. And I know you'd agreed to a Sunday event. I don't know if you've responded to the uh, Thursday night one on June 6th. But again, that's just five days before. That would be a great time to get people interested in having questions and hopefully coming out to the forum on, on the following Monday. Um, good? OK, great. So anything else? Nothing else. I would like to thank Amherst Media for uh, providing coverage for this uh, meeting, which will be made available on Amherst Media and through their normal um, channels, and I assume including their YouTube channel. And uh, so thank you, Amherst Media, and uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. And so so moved and seconded. All in favor? And all vote. Yep. We are adjourned at seven minutes after four.